I'm David Kelly. I'm a senior fellow at the Atlas Society and a consultant to the Atlas Shrug movies. From the very beginning of Atlas Shrug, people of ability have been disappearing. By a certain point in part two, Dagny Taggart is convinced that this is not an accident. Someone has been talking to them, someone she calls the destroyer. There are very few productive, dependable business people left. One of them is Ken Daniger, whose coal company supplies Reardon Steel, which makes Dagny's rails. Daniger is also the biggest customer of her railroad for shipping his coal, and he buys Reardon Metal, Hank Reardon's revolutionary new alloy, to shore up his mines. As Daniger puts it in the scene we're going to watch, it's a fine balance we have, win-win all around. But as it turns out, they all lose because of state intervention. Earlier in part two, Reardon and Daniger met secretly to work out a private deal in violation of the fair share law, which mandates that anyone who wants to buy Reardon metal get an equal share of the product. So now it's illegal for Daniger to order the amount he actually needs. That's why he and Reardon have to strike a deal in secret. But their deal has been exposed and they've been indicted. Dagny senses that Daniger might disappear and she rushes to prevent it. The Justice Department has just handed down indictments against Henry Reardon, billionaire manufacturer of Reardon Metal, and Kenneth Daniger, the nation's largest remaining producer of coal. Both men face up to 10 years in prison for flagrant violation of the fair share law. Eddie, I'm wheels down in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh? I need to know where Ken Daniger stands. I want him to know he's not alone. Miss Taggart. He won't be much longer, I'm sure. Dagny. I'm sorry. Ken, I thought... No, no. For, forgive me, Dagny. I, I'm sure I made you wait. It's so good to see you. Me too. So... They've handed down the indictments against you and Hank Reardon. It's a knee slapper. You could go to prison for a decade. Who is John Gull, right? Mr. Daniger, uh, Ken, you told me you love your work. I do. Are you quitting? It's a fine balance we have. You depend on my coal for power and to fill your hoppers. Hank uses my coal to make his steel. We use his steel to shore up my mines and lay your rail. It's perfect. Natural. Trading value for value. Everybody wins. Until something we can't control poisons that balance, then what do we do? I fight. I fought for every chunk of coal I've ever pulled out of the ground. And now, I can't set my price. I can't decide who to sell to. The government takes what they want and taxes what they leave behind. All I'm doing is feeding the beast that's trying to destroy me. You're just going to let them have your coal? It's not important. You're, you're welcome to it. Take as much as you can haul away. Dagny, you keep up the good fight just as long as you feel you need to. I've only got one thing left worth fighting for. What's that? This.
It's clear that Danadar has just met with a destroyer. But why is he disappearing? What has the destroyer said to him? When Dagny asks him why he's quitting, he says in effect that having a free mind is worth more to him than his entire company and all of his work over the years. He is working in one of the oldest industries of the Industrial Revolution, in one of the old coal fields in western Pennsylvania. But he's been successful because of the innovations he introduced. And where did those innovations come from? His mind. His eloquent gesture expresses Ayn Rand's profound insight that the use of force sidetracks the mind. Suppose a mugger threatens you, your money or your life. Before he pointed a, the gun at your head, you had plans for how to spend the money in your wallet. You had choices to make about which use of it would best serve your interests. Giving it to the mugger was not on the list of alternatives. Now it's the only thing on the list. You are now being governed by his will, not yours. The fair share law is a legal money. It's a rule imposed by force of law, preventing Daniger from making a deal that doesn't violate anyone else's rights. As Daniger tells Dagny, the fair share law and other regulations make it so that he can't choose the prices he sells at, and he can't choose his customers. If he were not subject to the fair share law, Daniger would make those decisions himself, using the information at hand, along with his knowledge and business experience. He would choose by using his mind but the law has sidetracked his mind. And the same is true in the real world, where people in business are tied up by rules and regulations that enforce work standards, pay scales, contract terms, and many other aspects of their work. The threat of force inserts an artificial barrier between your mind and your action, between your mind and your life. That's what Daniger has come to understand. His reasoning mind and independent judgment have been the source of everything he created. If he can save his mind, if he can remove the artificial barrier, he knows he can find a way to build what he needs again. But if he stays, he will be cut off from his business and end up with nothing, not even his independent judgment. As Ayn Rand often said, force and mind are opposites.